Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor and I'm a Sony Imaging Ambassador and welcome to my review of Sony's FE7200. It's a Macro G OSS and it's a Mark II version of the F4 7200 lens. Because we have a 10 year old 7200 F4G already in Sony's lens lineup, but the new addition here is it is a macro a lens or a lens being advertised as a macro. Now the original 10 year old uh, 7200 F4G I've actually owned for the full 10 years. So I have to say this lens owes me nothing because I've used it to create some fabulous uh, portraits and also some uh, landscapes with compressed perspective, cityscapes where I can't get uh, closer or I need to shoot the cityscape from further away. And I've also used it for wildlife. Now this is uh, this particular wildlife here, a red squirrel in the UK. I'm at the closest focusing distance of the lens. Now this is a 3.3 feet or one meter close focusing distance. And I'm about as close as I can get before the lens will no longer fo focus on this uh, red squirrel I basically had to shuffle uh, closer uh, each time the squirrel was feeding and then be absolutely still uh, when I was photographing the squirrel now I have managed to get uh, a little bit more magnification using this lens by shooting uh, on an APS-C camera or in APS-C mode on a full frame camera we can then push out the uh, the magnification to 0.2 now this is not bad you're probably thinking this is pretty close enough but we can do better and this is where Sony have done better with their new release. Um, I have also used this um, 10 year old 7200 in APS-C mode where I can do a two uh, times crop or a 2.25 times crop when using the R sensors. This uh, will push out uh, um, the magnification ratio uh, even a little bit more. So we can photograph quite small animals. This lens is also respectably sharp. So I'm gonna show you uh, why you might want to consider maybe looking at this new macro lens. Uh, it's got macro advertised on the barrel, but if we look at uh, the way uh, Sony described this, they call it a half macro. So I'm gonna explain uh, the terminology there. It's got a 0 0.5 times magnification ratio. The previous best close focusing distance with a good magnification ratio uh, was the FE 20 to 70 millimeter F4G lens. We're also looking at other good lenses uh, that have a good uh, magnification ratio, such as Sony's FE 100 400, which has got a 0.35 uh, times magnification ratio. The new GM2 versions have also got good close focusing distance. But the minimum focusing distance of this uh, macro, half macro lens, is 0.26 to 0. 0.42 uh, meters, depending on how close you are or the zoom length that you're working with on that lens. That is an incredibly close 0.85 to 1.37 feet. That uh, betters the original 7200 by quite a long way. We're nearly four times closer when using that uh, 70 mil focal length. So let's take a look at the 2070 with that 0.39 magnification. We can get in really close to some uh, very small natural objects and very small wildlife when using a lens with a good close focusing distance without having to actually purchase a 1-1 or full macro lens. Now, as I said, this is being advertised as a 0.5 magnification ratio or half macro, and it has that um, magnification ratio at all focal lengths from 70 to 200. It doesn't have just a sweet spot at the maximum focal length or the minimum. It's uh, got that constant 0.5 magnification ratio across the whole zoom range. Now we can actually get this uh, lens to do uh, one one macro or full macro with the addition of a two times teleconverter attached to this lens. Now that is gonna be the first good news that I'm pu pushing you away here because the original 7200 F4G would not accept the 1.4 and two times teleconverters. It's the uh, later telephoto zooms that could accept these. So if we shoot with the two times teleconverter and in APS-C mode, we're getting a full frame equivalent angle of view of 600 millimeters. So uh, quite a few people are a bit worried about, is there enough reach uh, on this lens? If I'm just pointing out that full frame equivalent angle of view, we can get this lens to multitask. 
So here I am, I'm putting a, uh, the two times teleconverter on this lens. I'm using my alpha one and I'm getting an equivalent 400 millimeter at F8. Now, and I haven't even gone into APS-C mode and I'm not using a particular crop. This is full frame. So you can see how close and personal I'm getting uh, with this particular Lima in this instance. And you can see that it's got good respectable sharpness even when using this two times teleconverter. So I think this uh, is the first point that I'm going to make is if you do need to get close to wildlife, uh, don't see that the 200 millimeter is a limiting factor to your creative needs. So here is a uh, two times teleconverter. And I didn't need the full zoom on this one. We're at uh, 318 millimeters uh, at F8. Uh, we do lose a couple of stops. And so we're starting at an F4. So we're going down to F8. Now, some people may be a little bit worried about noise by having uh, a maximum aperture of f8 but in these days of ai noise suppression such as adobe's denoise feature or topaz uh, denoise ai or dxo pure raw where basically the, the this shouldn't be a concern to you and here again, two times teleconverter, getting in uh, very close to some very tiny uh, bits of nature here in order to record this. OK, so let's take a look at uh, that two times teleconverter on the new uh, 7200 macro lens. And that's the one on the right with the two times teleconverter attached. So you can see uh, even with the teleconverter attached, it's coming in approximately the same uh, length as the original 7200 F4. So perhaps my uh, favorite way of getting a little bit of extra reach or getting a little bit of extra magnification ratio is to actually use the 1.4 times teleconverter. And then if I need a little bit more, just go into APS-C mode when using a full frame camera. This gives me an equivalent full frame uh, equivalent angle of view of 420 millimeters, but I'm using an F5.6 aperture now. So I'm only losing one stop. So we compare that to the maybe Sony's 100 400 with a maximum aperture of 5.6. I'm not losing out too much in, in uh, that uh, department there. If I put this on an APS-C camera or I'm shooting in APS-C mode or just cropping in post-production, which is pretty much the same thing, we can see that the magnification ratio increases. We have to apply the crop factor of 1.5 to that 0.5 magnification ratio. So now we're getting a magnification ratio of 0.75. And this is what it looks like uh, honing in on this uh, bee visiting uh, these yellow flowers. And I haven't uh, cropped this image other than to put it into that 16.9 aspect ratio you're looking at here. So if I was just to do a little bit of post uh, production cropping, we can quite quickly get that uh, one one magnification ratio, as you can see from this bead now pretty much uh, filling the frame. So this is the power of this new uh, macro 7200 F4 uh, G lens here. Just to give you an idea of the magnification ratio, here's a little finger put into the undergrowth with a tiny little feather that I found. And you can see how much we're actually magnifying very small uh, aspects of the natural world here. I labor this point a little bit longer, uh, talking about one one magnification ratio. And that's because a lot of people who are posting images online, they, they describe it as a macro image, but we're not at that one one magnification ratio yet. So I've, I've got a little inset image of a tiny little tree frog. It's not exactly the same species, but it's very similar sort of size to the, uh, the, uh, the tree frog that I've uh, photographed with the 90 mil macro lens here. And again, this has only had a very slight crop in post-production. If I now show you that I photographed exactly the same tree frog just a few minutes later using the 100-400 uh, G master lens, which has a magnification ratio of 0.35, I can still get that little tree frog to fill the frame. So having a, a macro lens, a 1-1 macro lens, uh, is certainly optional if you're not photographing things smaller than small green tree frogs.
So one of the advantages of photographing this, uh, say, with the 100-400 compared to the 90 mil macro is you have fast AF uh, with those linear focus motors. And so um, macro focus can be a little bit slow with the 90 mil and the 50 mil macro lenses. But when we're using uh, the telephoto zooms with fast AF motors, uh, we're getting that advantage. We're also a little bit more of a comfortable working distance if we're photographing wildlife that could get a little shy when we're going in closer with a shorter focal length. So this is the uh, 2070, uh, which I did say has the had the best magnification ratio of a non-macro lens at 0.39. One, you can see how close we can get to that little uh, two-inch high uh, Mickey Mouse there and how big that occupies the frame without cropping. You can see uh, it pretty much goes from top to bottom of that uh, the 35mm full frame sensor there. So if I photograph another character, and this uh, Minnie Mouse is the same height as that Mickey, and I put uh, Mickey over the top of an E-mount there so we can see that in relation uh, to maybe the uh, lens mount and the sensor behind that. Now with a 0.5 magnification ratio, uh, Minnie Mouse is going to be bigger than the sensor on the camera. So, um, And as we can see is if I then I pop in the 1.4 teleconverter and go into APS-C mode, I'm struggling now to get uh, the head of Mini Mouse into this frame composition. And we're actually working at a, a greater than 1 1 magnification ratio with the APS C mode and that 1.4 times teleconverter. So let's take a look at this in the real world because uh, I don't go around photographing Mini uh, Mouse and Mickey Mouse very often. So we're looking at uh, the APS C mode in a butterfly house, uh, 0.7 magnification ratio with very little crop in post production. So if uh, butterflies is uh, pretty much the smallest thing or insects is going to be the smallest thing you're photographing, then you're basically going to be filling the frame with this half macro or uh, 7200 F4G lens and this is uh, quite a small butterfly that you're looking at now compared to the last one and again another butterfly and really sharp images and because of the quick autofocus uh, we don't have to completely rely on these insects being completely motionless when photographing them because we're getting good AF performance and good sharp detail uh, when using this combination. If we're looking at slightly uh, bigger flowers, then we're going to be filling the frames uh, no problem with just the 0.5 magnification ratio. No need to go into APS-C mode. No need to put on a teleconverter most of the time. So I'll just show you some 0.5 magnification ratios of the natural world here. Some uh, tiny uh, seeds on the top of a uh, tall grass that I'm photographing. These are really tiny and uh, it's be beautiful to be able to explore the natural world that uh, things that we wouldn't make out with perhaps the natural eye uh, when photographed uh, with this particular lens, we can, we can marvel at uh, the detail that we can see in the natural world. Now this is uh, not even requiring a half macro lens, but these are the flowers that you might see in a botanical gardens or whatever. But the power of having that 7200 macro lens is we can go in and pull out some really really fine detail uh, from these flowers. So to create more of a visual narrative story uh, to look at the uh, context of what uh, the full size of these flowers and then going in looking for maybe insects visiting these flowers. So again, you can see the beautiful bokeh that we can get also when getting in close, the depth of field decreases. So I'm pretty much rather than stopping down to get full focus or full depth of field, leaving the aperture wide open at that f4 and getting some uh, beautiful uh, background blur uh, we've got a nine uh, blade uh, circular aperture here so we're going to get some beautiful bokeh behind the, the small objects that we're photographing as you can see in these examples here I think you get the idea. Uh, I actually like uh, shooting the macro with shallow depth of field. A lot of people uh, start looking at uh, focus bracketing and stopping down to f11.16, but I actually like photographing the natural world at this uh, f4 aperture. And uh, again, some uh, fine water droplets over this very small flower, and we can enjoy the detail and the light uh, striking the natural world. And again, some very small seed pods uh, exploring the beautiful bokeh uh, with the lens left open at f4. So let's take a look at another advantage of this uh, new Macro G OSS Mark II uh, lens that we're looking at here. 
Let's look at the size comparison, because as I said in the initial opening slide of this section, uh, size does matter to some. So we're looking at the 100-400 GM on the left, the 7200 F4G in the middle, and the new 7200 G2 on the right. And you can see it's getting a lot shorter. And of course, we're shedding weight at every stage as well. Here are some of the physical lengths and weights that we're looking at, 2.3 pounds on the left to 1.75 pounds on the right. A length of going down from 200 millimetres for the 100-400 to the 149 millimetres for the new uh, Mark II f4 lens here on the right now i do point out that in order to get the lens much shorter um, when we zoom the new macro lens the length does extend so we're getting an advantage that it's much shorter in one stage when we're finished work and we're packing away but when we're working and we do zoom to 200 millimeters you will see the lens extends and that is the way that sony have managed to get the new version much smaller in its uh, pack down state and I actually prefer this. Okay, we're not paying for anything in um, uh, performance, but what we are getting is uh, a camera uh, and lens attached. And now I can put this into a small messenger bag. Uh, I don't have to separate the two uh, or look at a slightly larger messenger bag. And so this is uh, my Pilot 7L. The most popular version of this is the 10L, but this is the smaller version. And I've chosen primarily to work with the smaller version. I've also got an, a second camera in there with the 2070 f4g so this is very much uh, an f4g kit going from 20 millimeters right through to 200 millimeters and i'll also pack in uh, a 1.44 teleconverter as well Let's take a look at some of the features of this lens because Sony have added some new features to this lens. So I'll just highlight uh, the ones that um, are new and that's full time DMF. This is really good when you're working with a long telephoto zoom and you're working very close to the minimum focusing distance is that if we start working um, at something in the distance, we can use full time DMF to help us get there really quickly. Sometimes lenses will struggle to find your subject if the whole viewfinder is completely out of focus. So we can, even when we've got continuous AF selected, we can quickly turn the focus ring to punch the focus to the other extreme and let autofocus take over. So this is not DMF, this is full-time DMF, which I find is much more useful as primarily a continuous autofocus uh, photographer. We've also got a, a macro focus limiter there now. So if we're only working at the very close focusing distance, uh, we, we're not going to risk the lens hunting out to infinity looking for your subject when it is right in front of the lens. We've also got a new steady shot mode three. The old one had uh, steady shot mode one when we're trying to keep everything as steady and still as possible. Mode two is for panning. Mode three is for erratic motion, which isn't just um, assigned to horizontal panning. So this would be uh, perhaps for sports where maybe players go up into the air or birds that are erratic, don't are not just flying from left to right or vice versa. They're all over the place. And this is where mode three will come into play. Performance uh, here in this new lens is more than skin deep. We have quad linear XD focus motors. We've got floating focus and a linear response MF. So this is a really quite high performing lens. So if you're looking for maybe uh, cheaper lenses uh, from Tamron or Sigma, just make sure that you're ticking all of the boxes because some of these performance features are, are giving you certain advantages. Now, it is worth saying that there is actually no Tamron Sigma or Samyong equivalents to this F4, uh, certainly not for the macro, but uh, a lot of the um, Sigma and Samyang and Tamrons go for F2.8 equivalents, but uh, they tend to leave the F4s alone at this current moment in time because uh, smaller, lighter, faster lenses is often not a priority uh, for these manufacturers. So I've just uh, listed uh, from heaviest at the bottom to lightest at the top and you can see for e-mount lenses the 7200 rises towards the clouds here I would point out that there is um, a 7200 for Canon users, which is even lighter than the new Sony lens. So that's the Canon RF 7200. But of course, we can't uh, adapt that 
to our Sony's. So the new Sony is going to be the lightest uh, offering around that if you, if weight is, uh, is a real uh, primary feature that you're looking for here now. You might want to pause the movie while you check out all of the comparative specifications. So I've got many of the ones that you might be looking for. I've even got a couple of atypical ones right on the bottom there, such as a prime lens, uh, which you might be considering a 135 prime, which is small and light, or uh, an APS-C 70-350. Again, if you're prioritizing smaller and lighter and prepared to use an APS-C lens in APS-C mode on your full frame camera. If we look at the top row, which is the 7200F4G2, we'll see that uh, best specification for weight, uh, if we ignore the Canon lens, it's got uh, a short uh, length at 149 millimeters, only bettered by uh, Sony's 70 to 300G. And we've got a smaller filter size. Some of these lenses have uh, 77 millimeter filters, but here we're down to 72. And of course, uh, its best features, it's got the uh, best magnification ratio of 0.5 times magnification ratio across all focal uh, ranges in that zoom and it also it is now compatible with the 1.4 and 2 times teleconverters got the price to be announced here because I didn't have this at the time of making this video but I'll probably put it into the uh, information below the movie okay so let's take a look at the Tamron this is a 2.8 and some people might be considering not only saving money but also uh, prioritizing a wider aperture but there are uh, some compromise specifications when uh, looking at that Tamron that you need to be aware of before making the final decision uh, one is uh, it's reasonably light, not as light as the Sony. It's um, it's reasonably short at 149 millimeters, which is the same as the Sony, but it is a, not a stabilized lens. Now, in-body image, image stabilization is really effective at the shorter focal lengths, but when you push out uh, beyond that 100 millimeter uh, focal length, Having a stabilization in the lens is an advantage, which is why you see Sony always add uh, optical steady shot into the lenses, as, and knowing that uh, users are going to use them on cameras with in-body image stabilization, but the interplay between those two uh, just gives you more performance. That Tamron does have a 0.5 times magnification ratio, which again is excellent, but only at the telephoto end. So uh, once you start uh, zooming out, then you lose that 0.5 times magnification ratio. And also it, it is not compatible with teleconverters. So you're limited to that 200 millimeters. And as I would stress, stabilization is really important because if you're going out with one of these longer focal length lenses and you, you don't want to get the tripod out, having OSS in the lens uh, and having it set to a mode one, many people uh, with a good stance and good breath control and a, a steady finger on the shutter release can sometimes pull one eighth, one tenth of a second and get a perfectly sharp image as you're seeing from this particular example shot with a 7200 telephoto lens. Cropability. Let's look at that 7200 because again some people I think will be thinking is that 200 millimeter a limiting factor? Surely I need to go out to 100, 400 if I'm shooting wildlife, action, sports, etc. So I'm going to look at this in a little bit more detail. Hopefully it doesn't get too confusing. Okay, so let's start off with full frame, uncropped, alpha one image, uh, over 8K, that means uh, 8,640 pixels wide. Now in post-production, obviously the dog is too far away to be of any um, interest or it's not very dramatic because we've got an awful lot of landscape and very little dog in action. So I'm going to crop in in post. Question is, is how much can I crop in before I go below 4 4K resolution, that's 3,840 pixels wide. And the answer to that is I can crop with a uh, crop ratio of 2.25. So if I apply that 2.25 uh, crop to my 200 millimeters, it actually gives me a full frame equivalent angle of view when cropped 
as if I'd been shooting with a 450mm lens and hadn't cropped. So that croppability that we get from very high resolution sensors, such as an Alpha 1 or an Alpha 7R camera, does allow you to punch in with shorter focal length lenses. And so long as the glass is good, we get rich, fine detail, full 4K output, 3,840 pixels long. And in, because this is filling a 4K 16:9 aspect ratio screen, that's 2,160 pixels high. So that's no teleconverter, no APS-C mode. I'm just cropping in post with a, a 2.25 crop. Now, this is a feature you can use with even with the 33 megapixel a7 4 um, the a7r4 a7r5 you're going to get this croppability uh, with uh, these type of high resolution sensors so there's just to show you the mass again 2.25 times crop um, you times that by the 200 mil focal length you get a, an angle of view of 450 millimeters Let's take a look at that again, maybe now using a 1.4 times teleconverter. So this is the uncropped image. And what you can see is even when we're using a 1.4 teleconverter and in APS-C mode, we can still crop in again because we've got a resolution which is still higher than 4K in APS-C mode because APS-C mode is a 1.5 times crop and we can crop 2 or 2.25 to get where we're going. So here's the 4K crop coming from APS-C mode on an Alpha 1 and again great um, uh, detail. And this has got a, again that 420 millimeters full frame equivalent angle of view. Let's just uh, look at reach again when shooting wildlife that we can't get closer to. So this is no APS-C mode, no teleconverters, 200 millimeters. So for uh, wildlife, by just moving in slowly without frightening the wildlife, we can fill the frame just at the 200 millimeter focal length. So I shoot a lot of birds without needing a 600 mil lens. And again, I haven't, I'm not cropping here. I'm not using teleconverters. I'm just trying to walk closer to this wildlife. And as I, I get closer, the background goes further out of focus and I'm getting these beautiful shallow depth of field shots. Okay, here's uh, an image at uh, 179 millimeters, just walking around nature, looking for what uh, animals and wildlife I can actually get close to without using teleconverters or cropping in post-production. And this was just, I, I was heading off to the beach, found this uh, parrot, just pulling out grass from the sidewalk and here it is photographed now with the 1.4 teleconverter attached at 280 millimeters and I never need to fear that I might be getting in too close to this wildlife because we have that macro capability of this particular 7200 lens so again with that 1.4 times teleconverter attached I'm getting into a bird that's probably a little bit uh, more nervous of my presence now in case I steal it's a little cupcake there now where I'm getting birds in flight, I might start with the 1.4 teleconverter because I'm going to start uh, capturing a sequence when the birds are quite a, a lot further away. So I want to be able to choose the image that I take out of the sequence. It doesn't really matter if it was further away or closer to me. That 1.4 times teleconverter gives me a little bit more flexibility when shooting birds in flight. And because I've done a post-production crop as well, I'm getting that 630 millimeter full frame equivalent angle of view. It's not a, few, a true 630 millimeter focal length, it's a, a 630 millimeter equivalent angle of view. Let's take a look at other images that I've been capturing with the 1.4 times teleconverter, such as this motocross uh, rider ripping through a field now. Again, this time using it on an APS-C camera, which gives me that reach as well as using a 1.4 teleconverter. Now working at a zoo with the 1.4 teleconverter at 280 millimeters. That's the 1.4 times teleconverter, uh, adding its um, 1.4 times magnification ratio to the two 100 millimeter lens which gives you that 280 millimeter uh, reach there and that is a, two, uh, a true 280 millimeters focal length not a full frame equivalent so this is at the 5.6 aperture we lose one stop by putting on the 1.4 times teleconverter
Let's take a look at the lens now in a portraiture scenario. We can see that we can get um, good uh, tight crops even when we're not standing too close. We can also get a very shallow depth of field when using such extreme uh, focal lengths at uh, maximum aperture. Just to um, give you one one crop now, zooming in to showcase the detail that this lens is pulling, even when we're cropping in very tightly. As long as your sensor is reasonable enough a resolution, we can pull out a, a horizontal framing from uh, the original vertical framing and still have detail to spare. So let's take a look at the f4 advantage. Now I love wide aperture lenses. I own 1.8, 1.4. I own the 2.8 400mm prime but there is certain advantages that come with having f4 apertures rather than the wider apertures. Again, I'll just reinforce the size. Uh, anybody who's looked at, uh, say, the 2470 G Master compared to the 2070 G, we're looking at closing on a half weight, half size lens there. So for people who are keen to work out of small, light messenger bags, uh, we can see the F4 advantage. And I should probably also mention there's going to be a cost advantage as well to investing in these. As I said, I've got the uh, 7200 attached to an Alpha 1. There, and I've got an Alpha 7C attached to the 2070 F4G in this small Pilot 7L messenger bag. If we look at the weight of all of the kit together, the Alpha 74, the 2070 F4G, the 7200 F4G2, the 1.4 teleconverter, you've got a weight of 2.5 kilograms or 5.5 pounds. That would probably go up to uh, three kilos if we added the second camera body there because you didn't want to be switching out the lenses. Now that is a very light portable kit and gives you the advantage of working from a messenger bag instead of a heavy backpack with uh, 2.8 G Master lenses. Now let's take a look at some uh, more full frame, uh, full resolution examples uh, captured with the lens uh, on location. First off, I need to point out uh, that we have very fast AF uh, with this lens. We've got the latest uh, linear XD focus motors. I believe there's four of the motors in this particular lens to move the lens elements exceptionally rapidly. So I'm showcasing not just one pin sharp image from a bird in flight. I'm showing you this was grabbed from a sequence of images shooting at maybe eight frames per second. And each one in the sequence is sharp. It's holding focus as we're shooting it. We're not just got one lucky shot. Sequence after sequence, this was proven over and over again. I was getting reliable focus pulling uh, even when the uh, subjects were getting very close to the camera lens. So uh, I'm always keen to test uh, dogs running at close range. This really tests the uh, AF performance of a lens, especially when they're running towards the lens. So we'll look at, again, sequences of images. And again, I could have chosen any frame of this and have uh, the dog's eyes pin sharp in order to get uh, the exact framing that I want. And I've chosen the frame here where the dog's ears are as high as possible in the frame. Erratic movement, this is where the steady shot mode three comes into its own. You're going to start panning as the which mode two would have done for the dog running along the beach. But as it launches in the air and you start moving the camera co uh, combination vertically, then that mode three steady shot is going to come into its own because that's going to align itself to what it is you're trying to do. And again, more sequences of images, punching in uh, again, always being able to fill the frame because I've got the choice of either shooting in APS-C mode, teleconverter or both. Okay, and as I said, the lens can pull focus really quite rapidly, even when the subject gets very close to the photographer. As you can see here, we've got the uh, animal subject detection enabled and it's tracking those eyes really faithfully, even at close range. This is where some older lenses tend to give up because pulling the lens elements with the focus motors gets really quite challenging when you've got rapidly moving subjects at very close uh, range. Now just showcasing a little bit of the panning as well as subjects moving rapidly towards the lens. I'll just uh, punch in, I'll magnify this image so you can see what we're looking at here. And that is usually pretty much all of the time being rewarded with good fine detail. Some people might be wary of the F4 aperture. You think you need a 2.8 to engage in 
proper photography. Is that F4 going to be a problem for some photographers? Obviously, when we're shooting landscapes, cityscapes, you're pretty much going to be stopped down anyway. So that F4 aperture is not going to be a disadvantage. This particular one was captured at F10. I'm trying to get the best possible uh, long exposure time to smooth the water using an ND filter as well. And so really I'm hovering around the F8 to F16 apertures. So the fact that I'm working with an F4 lens is it's not disabling my creative freedom to set out to do in this particular instance. Again, doing the same thing with moving water. The water was a bit choppy here. So we got the mass moving, but the the city is perfectly sharp in these particular images and I will give you high resolution examples if you if you need resolutions higher than the 4k movie that I'm showcasing now just click on the link and you will be able to get access to ultra high definition images so that uh, will fill your monitor but when you click in you can zoom in on my Flickr Pro account some people might say, oh, but with the F4 aperture, you're going to be uh, doubling your ISO compared to F2.8, and I'd prefer to have less noise. But remember, we're working in the days of uh, great AI noise uh, suppression. We've got the denoise feature in Lightroom and Photoshop. We've got uh, Topaz denoise AI and their photo AI software. We've got the DxO Pure Raw 2, Pure Raw 3 versions, all doing a sterling job at suppressing noise. So even when shooting at ISO 2000, the noise in the bokeh is troubling you a little bit. You can always suppress that noise. So the higher ISOs are certainly less of an issue this year than they were maybe last year. Shooting with an, uh, the F4 aperture, this time at ISO 5000. Uh, this is Tasmanian Devil, was really in some dark undergrowth here now. and uh, But again, we get a highly detailed image. And yes, I have pushed these through Adobe's denoise feature. Uh, but it just shows you that we can hang on to our fine detail and uh, remove noise from the equation using the uh, AI post-production software these days. Even ISO 5000 in APS-C mode or on an APS-C camera is still not an issue. And I actually haven't done a denoise to this one. So such is uh, the nature of a good sensor design from Sony these days is we can usually do what we want to do without having to worry about only having uh, an F4 aperture. Some might say, but yes, I want the wider apertures because I like the, the bokeh in the background. I need to defocus that background. Now, certainly I, I will get figure ground separation sometimes by using f1.4, 1.8 lenses. But if you can get reasonably close with a long telephoto lens, you're going to have more background blur than you can deal with often. To give you an example, this is 200 millimeter full frame at maximum f4 aperture and plenty of blur that will please most photographers okay and so you don't really have to apologize that we're not using a 1.4 aperture and that nine blade circular aperture is giving really attractive focus in my opinion on these images uh, just to give you a sense of how much blur we're getting, best to go a uh, full length uh, figure. So this is again 200 millimeter uh, maximum F4 aperture. And we can see the park behind this woman uh, is getting uh, pleasantly defocused. There's never going to be an issue where the background becomes too distracting because it's too sharp, even when working at F4. Again, portraiture, half-length portraiture, beautifully defocused now. So we get a sense of light in the background, but we're not looking at the texture of what that light is actually falling on. So more than happy to work in, in F4. And this, this is actually being captured on an APS-C camera. So the effective depth of field or focus is actually F5.6 equivalent. So that would pull even more sharp focus because of the smaller APS-C sensor. But still at the 200 mil focal length, still, on, uh, in APS-C mode or on an APS-C camera, we've still got plenty of figure ground separation. So I'll just stay with APS-C mode for a little while just to showcase that even in APS-C mode, that F4 aperture is still going to deliver what you need if we can get close to our subjects. Obviously, if your figure is way over in the distance and you're wanting to get uh, figure ground separation, Obviously, the 2.8 apertures will give you an advantage, but if you can, 
we're going to get a little bit close to your subject by walking closer we will defocus that background nicely and going in for some tight head and shoulders now and the background just becoming this silky bokeh blur there in the background getting in even closer for a cropped headshot now and the background is completely unrecognizable it could be pretty much anything it's shooting slightly down so we can see how much the shoulders defocus in this particular instance and again working f4 in on an APS-C camera remember that two and a half kilogram weight 5.5 pounds so uh, some people are really looking for an excuse to give up their backpack and maybe these f4 zooms the 2070 the 7200 mark ii are the sort of lenses that you've been waiting for you might be alternatively looking at a range of small lightweight primes but these two zooms will also tick all of the boxes for you as well and one of the reasons I love this uh, small form factor uh, is because on some jobs I would like to put it all in that Pilot 7L messenger bag, put it in my tank bag and uh, ride to my location because I can park my bike pretty much anywhere. Don't have to worry about parking when I get to the location that I'm going to. And of course, when I'm going on hiking trips where I'm taking camera gear, the weight of the gear obviously is uh, really important to me. So I've got a scheduled up a Paul photo workshop where I'll be the photography tutor uh, September 22 to October 7 uh, this year. I'll be certainly trekking up there with an APS-C camera or uh, full frame cameras with light uh, F4 zooms if I'm going to be walking the gear up to 18,000 feet. So as I've always said, that uh, I'm the easy one to spot when we're out on location and we've got to do any serious amount of walking. I'm the, basically the guy in the middle whose camera system weighs uh, less than all of the other guys' tripods. That sort of highlights one of the joys of me working as a photographer. Sometimes I'll take out the heavy gear, sometimes I pack the light gear. If you're wanting uh, more support for what you what it is you do, I do have an alpha support channel, which is uh, patreon.com forward slash Mark Gaylor. I have Q&A forums. Uh, I have over 20 hours of photography seminars that you can watch. I have cam set files, which is a way that I can set up your camera the same way as I've configured my camera via a file copied to your memory card. And I also have a range of 500 and 600 page ebooks that you can download. I also have a range of other ebooks which are not specific to cameras that you can also download. And this all comes with one $10 US subscription. And there are no contracts or commitments. So you can take the assets that you need, download them, and then unsubscribe. And you're only 10 US dollars out of pocket. Okay, so I'm Mark Ayler, Sony Imaging Ambassador. And uh, if you've enjoyed this tutorial just give me the thumbs up subscribe if you want to see future tutorials or uh, reviews and uh, i'll try and catch up uh, catch up with you online next time